Thanks to Babbel, a language learning app, for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in growing your language skills, Microcosmos viewers get up to 65% off when you sign up using our link in the description. This algae is stressed, and we can tell it's stressed because it's doing something that you might also do when you find yourself in a difficult situation. It's turning red. But while blushing brightly for everyone to see might make your situation worse, this algae can do something else that sounds honestly very appealing. It can curl up in a ball and just wait out the worst of it. This algae is called hematococcus, and it is not, physiologically speaking, turning red through these same mechanisms that you and I do when we are stressed and blushing. We flush with blood. Meanwhile, the hematococcus does not have blood. But depending on the state of your ancient Greek, you might recognize its name translates loosely to blood berries, a name that seems fitting for a round, reddish organism like this one. But as poetically sanguinary as the name is, hematococcus flushes with something else altogether, a chemical we can see traveling through the algae and up the food chain until it winds up on our own plates. But before we get to the dinner table, let us talk about where we got our hematococcus from a centuries-old cemetery in Warsaw, Poland, filled with beautiful sculptures and bird baths. For James, our master of microscopes, it is important to respect the tombs there, so don't worry, these microbes don't have particularly spooky origins. He's there for the bird baths, where the algae lines the surfaces like rust. The hematococcus likely arrived at the bird bath thanks to the birds themselves, and there it would have remained until maybe another bird came along, except this time your favorite microbe hunter came first. In addition to bird baths, hematococcus are often found in transient pools of fresh water, like puddles after a rainfall. And as you can see on your screen, not all hematococcus are red. Plenty of them are green, which makes sense because hematococcus is a member of the phylum Chlorophyta. And that phylum is full of many other unicellular green algae like the Volvox. And as an algae, hematococcus are green, photosynthetic, and very easy to eat, which makes them a simple, solid foundation for an ecosystem. But even seemingly simple creatures have requests of the world around them, whether that's for certain levels of light or a particular temperature. And if you were to, say, go to a hotel and your room was 100 degrees, you got a few solid options to fix that problem. You could find a thermostat, and if that doesn't work, you could complain to the manager, or even just go find another place to stay, but those are not great options for the hematococcus. There's no thermostat to change, there's no manager to call, and if the temperature gets too high, there's only so much a single-celled body can do to survive. So instead, the hematococcus does what I'm sure many of us wish we could do when we were in an uncomfortable situation. It takes a little bit of a break, forming a cyst that allows it to rest and survive until conditions are good again. When you're looking at this mixture of hematococcus, you are looking at a gathering of algae in different phases of their lives. The most active ones are called macrozooids, or zoospores. They might be shaped like spheres, ellipsoids, or even pears. And they are encased in a thick gelatinous wall, with two flagella extending out in front to zip the algae around. But most importantly here, at this stage, the algae is green. The hematococcus rarely reproduces sexually, and when it's a macrozoid, it divides rapidly, forming around 2 to 32 copies of itself. But it makes sense to move around and make more of yourself when conditions are good. What happens, though, when you're in a comfortable pool of water one day, and in much more dire straits the next? Well, for the hematococcus, this is the point at which it all begins to change. The algae sheds its flagella, layers up its wall, and shifts into a ball. This is the hematococcus as a palmella, a resting cell. But if stress has taught me anything, it's that things can always get worse. 
And for this little cell, it can get hotter or saltier, or just too bright, and when that happens, the palmella morphs into an aplanospore. Its walls become even heavier duty, shielding it from the outside, but most striking, this is when the hematococcus becomes red. The red is practical, the product of a chemical called astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a carotenoid, a type of reddish-yellow pigment found in plants and microbes. But it's more than just a pretty color. Astaxanthin is an extremely powerful antioxidant, protecting the cyst from potential damage as it rests. You've probably seen astaxanthin in real life, except you might not have called it that. You might have just called it pink, or salmon pink. Astaxanthin is found in plants, fungi, bacteria, and yes, in algae. And Hematococcus is considered to be one of the best natural producers of astaxanthin, able to produce up to 5% of its dry weight in astaxanthin. For comparison, another astaxanthin-producing algae called chlorella makes about 0.001% of its dry weight in astaxanthin. And the reason we find astaxanthin in so many animals is because algae make for good food, whether you are a shrimp, a salmon, or a flamingo. It's striking that the color we call salmon pink is a sign of both the salmon's contentment and the algae's demise. Perhaps we should start calling it hematococcus pink instead, an acknowledgement of the work of the hematococcus, which endures so long after its death. It would be a fitting tribute, after all, to a color you might have eaten a few times yourself. The salmon, sure, which might have fed on synthetic astaxanthin or on algae, but even the chicken eggs you buy might have gotten their yolk color boosted by algae added to chicken feed. Astaxanthin has its uses outside of our food, whether in our cosmetics or nutraceuticals, and while much of that is synthetic, a copy we've learned to make by studying the chemistry of astaxanthin, there's also a push in the market for natural products, a push that has led to renewed interest in the hematococcus algae and its wondrous ability to produce its own astaxanthin. But for the hematococcus, that's just something weird going on in the outside world. A factor far beyond its control and its interest. Whatever comes its way, whether it's a scientist, a bird, or a fish, all the hematococcus is concerned with is its own survival. What belongs to the algae will one day belong to another organism, passed on through chemistry, and made into something new. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thank you again to Babel for sponsoring this episode of Journey to the Microcosmos. Babel is a language learning app that helps you use a new language in real life situations after only five hours of practice. And it offers lessons in 14 languages. Whether you want to travel somewhere new and be able to speak the language when you get there, or you're just looking for some self-improvement that you can do from the comfort of your couch, Babbel courses are professionally designed by language experts who take into account your native language, and it will teach you vocabulary and grammar skills that you can use in real-life situations, like asking for directions or ordering at a restaurant. And Babbel even has a podcast, short stories, games, and new live virtual classes from certified teachers so you can learn in whatever format works for you. As a Microcosmos viewer, you'll get up to 65% off if you download Babbel and sign up by clicking the link in the description. All the folks on the screen right now, they are our Patreon patrons. And if you are one of those people, the Microcosmos team is very grateful and we just want to say thanks. If you would like to become a Microcosmos patron, you can go to patreon.com slash journey to micro, where you can also find some really good stuff that we've got only for our patrons. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there is always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. <laughs>